Right, I'm going to start my presentation now. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we will start with the webinar in this moment. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, the panelists to uh, pose their video and, and, and microphone and then I can present and then I'm going to call on Daniel to come in. One by one we'll get the panelists to, to present. So thank you for uh, joining us today everyone. I'm going to go get ready to share my screen with my presentation. Stop the music as well. And Daniel, if you can stop your video, please. Thank you. Oh, you want me to start it? Stop the video, and then I'll, when I call you back in, you can stop start it uh, again. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That. Done. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Today is uh, the fourteenth uh, week in a row of webinars from the Access Space Alliance. Uh, today, today's topic will be orbit servicing technologies from three great uh, panelists uh, which have joined us uh, to make a presentation on what they, or the technologies and things they are doing. Um, uh, let's uh, first remind ourselves of why we started this. So we at Access Space Alliance started this about 14 weeks ago, beginning of April, to promote companies in difficult times during the COVID pandemic around the globe. Uh, hopefully it's easing down uh, for most of us. Uh, I know there's other countries in the world which are still coping with this. We are still coping as well, but much less than, than we used to, but hopefully companies should be coming back uh, to work soon. Um, and, and basically um, we will then uh, change the, the topic from COVID to more uh, pro uh, PR uh, for companies in general. Uh, so this is webinars are to support you uh, as the attendees as well as the companies are presenting, uh, provide you information on, on what's going on around the world uh, with the space sector. How do we proceed? Uh, we have three great uh, speakers today as, as we usually do. Um, about 15-20 minutes presentation from each with one or two questions you can ask them by uh, writing a question at the very bottom. There's a, there's a box, a Q&A box. Please write on the box any questions you might have uh, during their presentation, and then we'll ask at the, at the end. Uh, then we'll have a 15-minute session of Q&As at the very end for all three of them. And uh, I will take the questions again from the Q&A box. Everyone from the audience will be muted, and I might call on you, uh, uh, depending on the question or, or the timing, uh, to ask the question yourself. So be ready to put up your microphone, and I will call on you. Today's uh, webinar has been sponsored by Lift Me Off, uh, a new startup company. Uh, I guess it's here in the UK. Uh, and uh, we'll have Michelle who's going to talk about Lift Me Off uh, in, in a second. Uh, thank you, Michelle, and Lift Me Off for, for the sponsorship. Um, so, in terms of the panelists today, uh, as I said earlier, we have Michelle uh, Pousset from uh, CEO and founder of Lift Me Off. Uh, Ron Lopez, uh, President and Managing Director of Astroscale United States. Uh, Daniel Faber, CEO and Founder of Orbit Fab from the West Coast. And of course, myself as the uh, moderator. Today's, uh, as you can see from the list of webinars we have run since the beginning of April, uh, is a list here. Uh, today's uh, on the top list here is Orbit Serving Technologies. I'm uh, preparing one from next week, hopefully on the 16th, uh, Thursday, 16th of uh, July. A panel on ITU WRC. I will be in uh, Sicily uh, then and I will take the webinar from there. Uh, hopefully that'll be the last one of the season uh, and then we will start again uh, sometime middle of August with uh, new webinars and, and new, new ideas. Today's webinar uh, we have about 227, uh, 28, 29, in fact uh, latest figures 229 individuals from 35 different countries in the world. Uh, who are registered. I predict about 60%, 50-60% of those registered will attend the webinar. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately in a way, we have a second webinar at, at four o'clock uh, on, on SSPI UK following this one, which I will, I will also host uh, in uh, 30 minutes after we finished. Uh, most of you have also registered for that webinar as well. So um, in terms of registration, you can see from this chart uh, and the statistics, we have roughly about uh, 100 people attending uh, physically uh, on the webinar each week now. Uh, the types of attendees are 
uh, a range of different disciplines and, and managements and uh, and uh, expertise uh, from 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 the, from the sector. Uh, you can see it's quite a range of people attending this webinar, um, which is great. Um, information is provided to all of us. And uh, past recordings of the webinars uh, are found on the YouTube channel. Uh, thanks to Alice, so you, you're gonna see her in a second uh, on a chart. Uh, she's actually put all these webinars recording on YouTube and she's helping us in managing those, uh, those recordings. Uh, I'll send you the link through the presentation. Or you'll receive the presentation later today or tomorrow. Uh, you can then click on the link and, and look at the recordings, past recordings if you like to. Okay, let's move on. Uh, this management team uh, of Access Space Alliance. We created Access Space Alliance uh, nearly about a year ago, March 2019, uh, to help the uh, small uh, satellite sector in general. Uh, Betty, myself, and Christian are the directors and co-founders of the Alliance. And uh, today, uh, also, we have Alice helping us on the uh, on the team with uh, some of the data management and, and videos of, of these webinars. Uh, the alliance is uh, there to unite and represent uh, the small satellite sector. O of course, we also have uh, larger satellite manufacturers as well as uh, operators with us. Uh, uh, we're not just uh, limited to the small sector, but uh, we try to be as broad as we can also globally, not, not just the UK. Even though we are based in the UK, we have many companies actually working with us around the globe. We're here to connect uh, different companies, foster collaborations, advise them, uh, whatever they need with expertise and our experience and all between themselves as well. Advocating promote policies uh, for the benefit of the sector, promoting and educate in, in education, create awareness and opportunities for the sector. And of course, uh, uh, researching uh, R&D companies are welcome to work with us. And, and one of our objectives is to actually create standards, procedures and uh, uh, white papers or policies basically to promote the sector around the globe. We have now, uh, in fact, about 85 different companies joined, joined us so far. Uh, and uh, we have three different offices, UK, one in France and one in Germany as well, uh, just uh, to help the sector. Uh, here's the logos of most of the companies that have now joined us. And also we are partnering uh, with two uh, organizations in uh, India and China. I know that uh, the Comms Alliance from, from uh, Australia also would like to join us soon. Uh, we also have an MOU with the CPT uh, and we are uh, an observing member of the CPT so we can contribute to the CPT uh, uh, in, in case we need to promote particular policies at, at the CPT level. Soon we will be joining the ITU as well. Membership of the Access Space Alliance uh, is divided between the UK, one third of the members are British, uh, one third uh, around Europe, uh, France, Italy, uh, Germany, uh, of course, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, as well as Belgium, uh, and others are, have joined us, uh, Bulgaria, in fact, as well. Uh, and of course, United States, we have about 20, 23% of the membership and the rest of the world as well um, are there. Let me also uh, tell everyone that we have uh, set up a committee on uh, free space optical communications. It started actually in, uh, in May. Uh, we had already two meetings. Uh, we also are starting in August a regulatory and space policy uh, committee. A lunar develop deployment committee is actually uh, starting soon as well. Within the next couple of weeks, we're gonna have our first meeting and also European Affairs Committee as well. Uh, if you're interested, you need to be a member of the Access Space Alliance to. Um, 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 come and, and actually attend these, these committees. Um, if you're interested, let me know. Just write to myself and I will give you more information. Uh, lastly, uh, if your company has any opportunities available for uh, people to be hired or, or uh, new graduates or even students internship, if you like, or uh, university students uh, that are doing their thesis, let us know. We can uh, spread the word that you're looking for someone or you have an opportunity uh, and we can help you to find candidates for these kind of opportunities you, which you might have as well. Uh, so right, just write to myself and I will um, uh, do whatever, whatever I can to help you. So we're gonna start a webinar. Uh, we're gonna have Daniel uh, uh, Faber from, um, um, to start the webinar, then we're gonna have Ron, and then we're gonna have Michelle uh, in, the, in that lineup basically. So uh, Daniel, can you, uh, 
uh, Orbit Fab. Uh, in fact, can you please uh, come on, come on board now? And then you can start sharing your videos. I'm going to stop my video. And then I'm going to go off and it's all yours now, Daniel. Great. Thanks very much, Tony. So, uh, yeah, very, very uh, happy to be on here and kicking off this webinar. Um, I'll talk uh, about OrbitFab and how we see um, satellite servicing uh, evolving. I think uh, being followed by Ron and Jill are, is, uh, is perfect for, uh, for this panel. Um, so OrbitFab is about gas stations in space. We are, uh, started this company uh, because at a, at a previous company that I ran, we were, we were trying to um, sell thrusters that were very cheap, but didn't have the highest fuel efficiency. And our customers uh, had to constantly do that trade-off between buying an expensive thruster to move their satellite around or taking a, buying a cheap thruster and taking more fuel on the rocket. Uh, decided that there had to be a better way to solve that problem. But uh, it's, it's part of an ongoing um, transition that we're seeing in the, in the industry. Um, at the moment, we, we have a space economy. We have a, a $380 billion space economy, but we have no economy in space. If you launch a satellite, it's, it's inaccessible. You don't touch it. You, you try to move it around as little as possible to make its fuel last as long as possible. But in the future, we see a bustling space economy. And we now have, have uh, uh, a lot of activities and a lot of investments going into this. We expect to see things being traded, uh, products and services traded in space. So we want to support that transition. What we see when we, we look at assets of, of similar lifetimes, cars and planes, they refuel quite a lot. They, they have that mobility. In fact, even, even rockets now are being refueled with, uh, with SpaceX up to five, but maybe six now refuelings of their rockets and, uh, and possibly more for the suborbital rockets at Blue Origin. But satellites don't get refueled. We, we just throw these assets away when we run, they run out of fuel. And that severely limits what we can do with them. Some of the things that we've seen this year that uh, have really sort of highlighted that this, this trend is changing uh, in terms of the way that we deal with satellites in orbit. Uh, Northrop Grumman are now operational with their MEV-1, the first commercial satellite servicing mission. Uh, and so uh, it started operating in, in February or March. And uh, it's really sort of opened the door where companies have not had the option of servicing their satellites before. Uh, now they see that this is a reality. And so there's a, there's a lot of interest. Uh, Northern Sky Research put out a report on satellite servicing, um, showing the, uh, the various use cases for, for servicing other satellites. And interestingly, 85% of these were, uh, were fuel dependent, were things for moving satellites around in orbit. So that means that, that while these, these servicing spacecraft <clears throat> are, uh, are becoming mature, they're still relying on carrying a single tank of fuel, and that fuel is, is the thing that determines how much they can do with their, with their missions. In this ecosystem, we're now talking with a, a lot of companies. In fact, there are 36 companies or, uh, that are working on satellite servicing. I mentioned Northrop Grumman are, are operational, of course, Astroscale on this call. This slide I've realized is, uh, needs to be updated. There are constantly more companies that we are realizing that are working in satellite servicing. And they're across various different business models, life extension, tugging, deorbiting, inspection, just taking photos of other satellites is something that's not really been possible before, uh, and robotic servicing. Um, so there's a good number of companies that are now looking at different ways to help other satellites in orbit, to provide services and uh, as well as products in orbit. And in case the, uh, the timelines of these are, are questionable, here is what we've found the different companies with the different business models talking about introducing their services. So you can see some are, are already uh, operational. In fact, arguably uh, orbit insertion tugs have been operational since the, uh, the 80s or 90s uh, in some government programs. Uh, but now we see life extension has come online and we're seeing the tests lining up for a lot of these other types of business models. So where does OrbitFab fit into this? Really, we are building gas stations. 
And, uh, and so we build tankers. We also, when we first tried to build our, our first tanker, we failed because there was no fuel import. So we stepped up and said we would build fuel imports as well. And so we build fuel imports and tankers. Um, our customers can, can take the fuel imports with their spacecraft into orbit. We will launch the tankers. And then working, working with the satellite servicing companies, we can deliver propellant to them for their use. And then they can deliver the propellant to their customers. So we are the gas station in the local suburb that, uh, that a satellite servicing vehicle, which you can think of as a, as a tow truck, comes to, to to buy fuel. So here's, here's how it works. We build these tankers. We, um, we put them into orbit on uh, all of using any available rocket. So we can access all the rockets that are across the industry. Uh, on orbit, we manage the logistics, the orbital mechanics. We make sure that the propellant is available uh, where it's needed, the right propellant that's needed, so that our customers can come and get propellant uh, and then go and continue making money, providing services, increasing the capabilities of things in orbit. So I mentioned that fueling port. That was, that was the first thing that we needed to tackle. Uh, we've built this hardware now. We've sold about half a dozen fueling ports. We have some government contracts. Uh, we have contracts in Europe, Asia, and North America. So this is starting to get adopted. Um, just a little video about how the fueling port works. Uh, it comes and connects automatically with four fingers, providing a very solid connection. And then we can transfer high pressure propellants between the two spacecraft. So uh, in the first 18 months operating, we built hardware. We've, uh, we've built and as I saw, sold uh, some of those fueling ports. We also built an inflatable tank that can be launched empty and stowed so that a very lightweight satellite can take on a lot of fuel. Uh, and we did tests with our tanks and plumbing and valves. Uh, that was actually launched into the International Space Station. We became the first private company to resupply the space station with water. We, uh, we used that water as, uh, as our propellant or propellant simulant that we were transferring between an inflatable tank and a rigid tank. So all of plumbing, valves, and, uh, and connections and things were tested in this mission. Uh, that informed a lot our fueling port, which we hadn't built at this time. Uh, and so that's come from, uh, from this mission as well. We are able to verify those technologies. So that's, um, that's really where we've got to at this point. We are building our first operational tanker, uh, which we expect to launch in the next year or so. And, uh, and we are actively selling the fuel imports. Uh, we're now working on other technical problems that, uh, that we believe are needed to solve the, uh, the satellite servicing, um, you know, to help customers in the satellite servicing industry to help them access fuel so that we can provide that fuel and that propellant uh, across the industry. That's going to allow greater mobility and uh, we're looking forward to seeing some of the applications that uh, come up beyond the list of obvious things in satellite servicing. There's a huge amount of potential for, uh, for new missions, high delta V missions, reusable spacecraft, uh, and the whole on-orbit assembly uh, servicing manufacturing. So uh, with that, back to you, Tony. Excellent, thank you. Um, as we have uh, waiting for some questions from the audience, uh, if the audience you would like to ask some questions, uh, use the uh, Q&A button at the bottom, please, uh, for Daniel. Uh, I'll ask a, qu a question, Daniel, uh, on your side. Have you sorted out your commercial uh, proposition? What will be the type of cost or the type of fees you might charge uh, someone to refuel the satellite? Yeah, absolutely. We work with our customers looking at the value that can be created. And as you might imagine, that's, that's variable. Um, so when the value is high enough that it can justify uh, us delivering fuel and, and building this infrastructure, um, we, we look at, uh, at ways to make that work for both the customer and for us. So it, it tends to be fairly case specific because uh, the orbital mechanics and the, and the propellant types and the delivery um, you need to be worked out. And so that is that is a, a conversation we'd be happy to have with, uh, with anyone who has a, a serious need for propellant in orbit. Um, but uh, we've, we've found a lot of cases that uh, will work uh, in the early years. And as we stand this up and can drive the prices out of our system, we're able to service more customers. So I can't be more specific than that because the answer is complex. Okay, excellent. Uh, a couple of questions I have online from Paul Hutter. How big are the fueling ports? The fueling ports are about the, uh, well, the, there's two, a passive side and an active side. The passive side is about uh, 
40 millimeters high by about 60 millimeters diameter. Uh, the active side is about the size of a one U cube set. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you one more question, then the rest of the questions I have about nine uh, is great. Uh, we will ask them at the end. Uh, please don't delete them uh, or move them. Uh, we'll do them at the end. Uh, we'll ask them uh, live. Next question from Karthik Narayap Napa. Uh, what's the volume of the propellant that can be stored in both inflatable and the rigid tanks? The inflatable tank that we launched to the International Space Station and tested inside the station could hold 12 litres uh, and was about uh, a 2U CubeSat dimensions, if you like, um, uh, when it was stowed. The, um, the rigid tanker that we launched to the space station held a similar amount of propellant, so about uh, 12 litres. There's no limit to how big these can go. Um, we have concept designs for five-ton tankers, um, but our first tankers will be relatively modest in order to uh, make sure that, that we're controlling our capital expenditure uh, as we start doing all of the testing with these uh, and setting up these network of tankers. So our, our first tankers will be able to deliver uh, tens or hundreds uh, of liters, our later tankers hundreds to thousands of liters. Excellent. Uh, I think we have more time uh, to ask you a few more questions, uh, Daniel, because uh, you actually were quite quick in presenting. Let me actually, and I have lots of questions here on the Q&A box. Okay. I'm gonna ask Helen uh, Tabeni. Helen, can you get on the microphone and maybe you can ask the question yourself, please? I'm allowing you to talk now. Sorry for the last minute request, Ellen. Well, let me ask the question. Yeah, I think she's on now. Go ahead, Ellen. Can you speak? Well, I'll ask the question. Um, it's regarding regulations uh, and legal obligations. How committed are the companies involved in this area to develop uh, self-regulations, laws, and liabilities, given the incredibly slow pace of international legal development? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, there is, of course, regulations that do exist uh, internationally and, and nationally, uh, but there's a, there is some uncertainty about best practices and, uh, and exactly how to proceed. Um, the last thing we want to do is to, to have a proliferation of, of accidents that are happening in space. My co-founder, Jeremy Scheel, is actually the vice chair of CONFERS, which is an industry association working to establish best practices and standards for satellite servicing. And so we support the industry uh, through our participation in that organization. And, uh, and that's then uh, defining sort of the operating concepts and approaches to rendezvous and docking uh, and various things. Now, that may make its way into something like a, an ISO standard, uh, a technical standard. It may make its way into government regulations. Uh, the group is, is not at this point a, a lobbying group or a standards group, but is, uh, is working to establish that and, and create cooperation uh, across the industry. Excellent. Uh, another legal question from Luis de Guillon. Uh, in case of an accident, it will be liable, your company or, or the service satellite? So I'm not a, a legal expert. We've been talking with insurance companies about uh, how, do we, how to do that. And there is an example now, of course, uh, with the Northrop Grumman MEV having been a, a commercial operation uh, docking with a, a commercial satellite. And so there is, uh, there is some precedent that, that this has been done, though not precedent of, uh, of any uh, accidents or failures yet. So in some ways that might be an open question, but I do believe that, uh, that others are handled that. Uh, as we look at our operations, our intention is to be like a gas station, a, a passive uh, system that our customers will come to. Uh, so our customers will be doing the docking with us. And so we rely on, on them a lot to have solved some of these problems. And, uh, but we're actively in, in discussions and uh, in the middle of, of that kind of debate at the moment. Uh, Philip Day, uh, would you be able to ask your question once I allow you to the microphone on? Just a second, Philip. Go ahead. Can you put your microphone on, Philip? Hi. Can you uh, can you hear me? Sure. Yes. Perfect. Um, I just wanted to know uh, if you're planning to stockpile fuel on orbit, or if you're going to be looking to boost fuel specifically for each of the missions that your customers come to you with. 
I'm guessing it's probably a bit of a mixture of the two, but I just wondered uh, where your thinking was on that for now. It is our intention to hold inventory in orbit. Um, everything, of course, has to be launched from the ground right now. Um, though our long-term goal is that we'll be able to use propellant that's extracted from asteroids or the moon and, uh, and bring that into the supply chain. So uh, in that case, um, we'll have a different type of inventory profile. But uh, yes, right now we've, we've looked at which orbits are the most common orbits where our customers are likely to be uh, and how we establish a network of tankers in advance, uh, placing that propellant there uh, and managing the whole supply chain to be cost effective and convenient. Last one, and then we'll go on to, to Ron. Last question uh, from anonymous person. How are you going to mitigate space pollution and how are you going to deorbit your tanks? What altitude customers are you targeting? It's three questions in one, sorry. Yeah, so Ron may be the better person to, uh, to answer this. Astroscale is actively working on, uh, on some of these things. From our own perspective, our, our tankers uh, will be taking out um, insurance policies and, uh, and contracts with companies like Astroscale to deorbit our tankers if there's anything that goes wrong with them to make sure that they're not um, just sitting around uh, in orbit uh, littering the place up. Uh, we'll also have micrometeoroid detection, uh, sorry, protection in our, in our tankers so that uh, small micrometeorites and, and small pieces of debris won't be able to, to puncture the, the tankers and cause catastrophic failures. Uh, and there's a very small thruster on each of our tankers that allows it to um, do collision avoidance and deorbiting at, at end of life. So it's a, a multi-level strategy from our perspective, but uh, as an industry perspective, uh, the satellite servicing companies are, are able to do a lot more because they are more mobile and they have uh, better equipment to deal with, uh, with debris and, and be able to remove it. Perfect. Uh, we're going to move on now to Ron Lopez. Thank you so much. Daniel, great presentation. We'll come back in about uh, uh, 40 minutes for more questions. Ron, you're on now. You can start sharing your screen and your video. Thank you. Okay. And great. Daniel, uh, if you could stop your video, please. Thank you. Uh, so can everybody see my screen and can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I always like to check because it doesn't matter how many times we do uh, virtual calls during this pandemic. It seems like I always forget to hit the mute button or, or, or something else. So uh, thank you very much for, for having me, Tony, and for the introduction. Uh, very happy to be here on Access Space and have an opportunity to talk a little bit about this really important part of this uh, new economy that, that's developing. A couple of great segues there from Daniel's conversation that I, that I hope to, uh, to hit on. So I'm going to take a little bit of a... Um, of a big picture view, if I can get my slides to move. There we go. Uh, so I think for the audience that's attending here today, there's really not much need to talk about the importance of space, right? I think everybody here really gets that uh, space touches every aspect of our lives, right? And uh, of course, you know, uh, in, in many ways that of course we're all aware of, but there are many people uh, uh, that are completely unaware that space is absolutely critical to their day-to-day uh, -day, uh, functioning, right? Every, you know, from uh, getting uh, maps uh, to, your, to your friend's house, to weather forecasting, to performing financial transactions, uh, et cetera. A lot of this is enabled by, by space. And that's why it's really important that we manage that space environment uh, well, uh, so that it can, we can continue to use it and, and benefit from use of that space environment in the future. And the explosion of space really uh, is incredible. If you look at it uh, back over the last 60 years, uh, since the first launch of Sputnik in 1957, uh, there have been about 9,000 satellites put into orbit, uh, many of which, uh, unfortunately, of course, have already uh, expired, uh, reached their end of life. And so there are still a handful of about half of those that are still active. Um, uh, are actually just a, maybe a third of those that are still active, less than a third. Uh, and all of them, of course, or most of them anyways, are, are still up there in, in space. Um, and, you know, of course, this is uh, 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 nothing compared to what's being projected to be launched over the next decade. So we've had, as you see here on this chart, about 9,000 satellites launched since we started putting things in space. And over the next decade alone, 
we anticipate uh, that about three times that number is going to be launched uh, into space. So that's going to add a lot more capability. It's going to help grow the space economy, uh, uh, improve the robustness of, the, of um, a lot of those services that I talked about on, on the last slide. And so that's the good, the good news, right? The good news is that there's more of this coming. The bad news is that there's more of this coming, right? Um, and somebody just asked the question about space debris. That's one piece, um, uh, limiting and, and managing that debris problem, managing the space environment is gonna be absolutely critical. Uh, and making that environment sustainable is, it's, it, debris is one piece of it, but it's also about making better, more efficient use of the assets that are up there so that when I really, when I'm talking about sustainability, I'm not just talking about the maintenance, the maintaining of the space environment itself, but I'm talking about sustainability from a business model uh, perspective of well. And that's gonna be critical to, to, the, to the growth of the space economy. So um, uh, much is said about the growth of the trillion dollar space economy. And Daniel had a, a great point in his chart where he talked about uh, the space economy and the economy in space. And we're really at a historical moment where we're, we're growing the space economy, meaning adding economic value back here to us on Earth, but also growing the economy uh, in space. Uh, either way, I think we're still in the very early stages <clears throat> of this. And the analogy that I like to use is the Wild West, right? Uh, for those of you uh, maybe not familiar with American history, I'm sure you've all seen cowboy movies where you have uh, uh, folks heading out west in, in the early days of expansion into the west. The gov U.S. government passed a the law, the homestead law, which allowed people to go out and claim land. A lot of people say, great, we're going to go get some. They jumped on a wagon and headed out west and staked a, a, a claim somewhere. Um, that really didn't add much to the U.S. economy, right, in, in, the early, in the early stages. It wasn't until the infrastructure uh, was put in place that, that allowed that economy to grow, the, the, the railroads that allowed for the efficient transfer of products and services, the postal service and telegraph that allowed for uh, the effective and efficient flow of information. Uh, regulatory regime, there was a question about regulation. It wasn't until there were, were laws put in place that gave investors uh, confidence that they were going to get a, a return on their investment, that it wasn't just total lawlessness, uh, that then allowed real investment to, to come in, more infrastructure to be built, and that kind of snowballed or, or then uh, kind of grew exponentially, uh, as, as well as a variety of different methods, um, uh, you know, law and order, sheriffs, and, and other mechanisms to protect those investments and those assets that were in the West. And it was at that point that we then really saw uh, the expansion of, of the West as an economy and a real contribution to the U.S. economy. And I think there's a lot of parallels here to where we are in, in space right now. So we're on the verge of this. But we need to lay in that infrastructure, and that infrastructure is basically on-orbit services, right? It's it's the the uh, tug services that that uh, you saw in, in Daniel's presentation, right? The, the tugs are moving things around, the transport of goods and services, in situ SSA, uh, which is information not just from space but about space that will enable people to make better informed decisions about what's going on and uh, protect their assets and how to conduct their operations uh, in space. And uh, all of these things are absolutely critical if we're really ever going to see that space economy grow. Space is probably the only endeavor of human operations where we're talking, whether we're talking about commercial markets or, or defense uh, oriented space, space is the only endeavor uh, segment of operations that does not have a support or a logistics tail. You launch a satellite, you know, and, and you hope for the best. Um, obviously, companies like uh, SpaceX are, are changing that paradigm uh, on the launch side, and we need to change that paradigm uh, in, the, in the satellite business as, as, as well. And that's exactly why um, there's a lot of uh, projections out there about the growth of the on-orbit or the in-orbit servicing economy, which is what this slide here describes and kind of breaks it out by, um, by orbital regime. Uh, this next slide here talks about the same thing, the growth of that space economy, in terms of the specific services that we see coming on, on, on board. And this is not an exhaustive list. It's really just intended to be, uh, this is just the list that Astroscale is, is focused on. 
So there's life extension specifically at, at GEO, where as you all know, satellite op uh, satellites tend to run out of fuel at the 15 year point, but are still usable. So uh, as Northrop Grumman has demonstrated with their MEV platform, the ability to go up and attach to the satellites and extend their life really gives uh, the owner operators a lot of strategic options. It helps them uh, give them some strategic breathing room and see how things are going to play out in LEO and decide when and how to recapitalize their, their fleet to GEO, which are very expensive, as you know, those are big expensive capital outlays. And um, uh, in addition to, of course, generating revenue for a few extra years, which is always good from a business perspective. Uh, in situ SSA and in inspection using satellites to assess the space environment, which is very important for safety, and also inspection, which helps support insurance claims. There was a question earlier about liabilities. Well, being able to inspect and what's going on with a particular satellite is very important to answering some of these questions uh, uh, engineering, there are technical questions that are important to uh, be able to answer that liability question. Um, and then debris removal, which is uh, a very core part of our business. Active debris removal, which is what we call going up and getting the stuff that's already up there, the, the big rocket bodies, and removing just a few of these in highly congested and populated orbits uh, greatly de-risks those orbits and enhances spaceflight safety. And then end of life services, which is about uh, getting all the mega constellations, all of these great services that are going to launch into um, uh, into space in the coming years, getting those satellites to launch with a docking plate on them that are compatible with our robotic arm so that they can be serviced at their end of life, uh, you know, five, six, seven years, or if they happen to fail on orbit. And we expect that a lot more satellites will fail in LEO than they have historically just because the economics are very, are very different than, than uh, what they used to be. Um, and then uh, there's the on-orbit services, uh, the other uh, orbit transfers rather, uh, the tug services, moving things around and other uh, related services like what uh, Daniel just talked about, right? And moving things around, refueling them, servicing them, et cetera. These are all things that are, that are coming and things that are astro scale uh, is interested in. So I've talked a lot about the space economy and, and, and things that we're doing, but I really haven't talked about it. And I said, okay, well, Astroscale is doing these things. Uh, so who's Astroscale? So we're a company that was founded about seven years ago, and we are focused on securing long-term space flight safety and orbital sustainability. That is, is our vision. Our mission is to then bring together the technologies, the business models and cases, and working the policies. There was also a question earlier about policies. We believe that this is the you know, one of the three legs, uh, pillars of our strategy to work all of the policy issues, uh, issues as well that will create the environment that allows us to manage the debris problem as well as provide on-orbit services. Uh, we're still a relatively small company founded by a Japanese CEO um, about seven years ago, uh, headquartered in Japan, Astroscale Holdings uh, is, is in Japan, and we have three profit and loss subsidiaries uh, one in the UK, headed by, by uh, my counterpart, uh, John Auburn, uh, Astroscale Japan, headed up by Chris Blackerby, who's also our corporate COO, and Astroscale US, uh, which I head up here. And uh, we recently acquired Effective Space Solutions uh, of, of Israel and um, uh, created Astroscale Israel and moved all of the employees and the assets uh, into that entity. And they will be a key supplier for us of the payload that will enable the life extension business, uh, which uh, we are, are now jumping into uh, head first. And so that is uh, my view of the space economy, of the importance of logistics and, and uh, how it will enable the growth, uh, really underpin the growth of that, that new space economy and that economy in space. And uh, a, a few things about what we're doing in that market segment and um, uh, with that, I uh, uh, will turn it over to, to questions. Look forward to your questions. I, thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. And uh, I actually uh, witnessed uh, when Noble came to the UK many times to uh, create a buzz about uh, this type of uh, solutions and technologies basically since, uh, as you say, seven, six, seven, six, seven years ago, basically. So give my regards to Noble when you see him again. I will. Um, thank you. In the meantime, as we uh, wait for audiences to ask questions, and there are a lot coming uh, on, on our way now, uh, let me ask the first one, which was asked before to Daniel. 
what are the customers are you targeting in terms of uh, orbital heights? Uh, are you looking at only a Leo or a Mio as well in Geo? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, this chart here, if you can see it, it says Astroscale Services represents the different segments of the market that Astroscale is, is targeting. So starting in, in Leo and working up, um, a lot of our focus to date has been uh, on the debris problem and therefore on, on Leo end of life services and active debris removal is really a, a, a Leo play and we're looking to extend those technologies with other customers that we're talking to who are interested in orbit transfers and mobility at, at Leo so that they don't have to use their, their own uh, fuel. Uh, and then the life extension business that I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, which is enabled through our acquisition of, of uh, the, the team and the technology there at ESS, uh, is Geo. So we, uh, like to say that we are the only company that is solely dedicated to on-orbit services and we're doing that at all orbital regimes. Leo, uh, Geo, uh, Mio, of course, there, there's some customers with, with interest there. And then looking further afield, um, you know, we might be looking at Cislunar as well. But right now we're, we're looking at uh, uh, all the way Leo to Geo. Have you done your first um, test uh, testing of the uh, platform? I know that uh, a couple of years ago, or, or a few months ago, in fact, um, as I was working for OneWeb, uh, we were looking to do some kind of a testing with you. Have you done any such testing uh, since you know the last two years or so? Yeah, um, yeah. Th thanks for asking because I forgot to mention that during my my presentation. So the little uh, 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 satellites that you see at the lower part of the screen there, that's actually um, a uh, uh, rendition of. LCD, which stands for End of Life Services by Astroscale Demonstrator. So that satellite uh, has been built. It's sitting uh, in our clean room in Japan right now and will be shipped out uh, soon. And we're expecting that that will launch later this year. And that will be the first end-to-end uh, -end mission demonstration on space, in, in space. There's been a lot of other tests of specific technologies. This mission will not only demonstrate some of those uh, key technologies, but demonstrate the ability to conduct a docking and debris removal mission under a variety of different operational constraints and, and conditions. Uh, we don't have time here, but if any, if you folks would like to visit our website, astroscale.com, there's a three minute video on there that explains that CONOPS. So to answer your question, Tony, that test is coming up soon. We're really excited about it. And um, uh, it, yeah, it'll be, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll be hearing more about it once it launches. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, Elefterios uh, is asking a question, which is basically the following. Does Astroscale have signed any contracts for active debris removal so far? So the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, uh, has uh, let a contract which is being done in two phases for active debris removal. Uh, as I think maybe you all know, the Japanese government uh, uh, sees space debris uh, as a big issue and have taken uh, positive steps to uh, take a leadership position in, in, this, uh, in this area. And therefore the, the, the JAXA contract called, let me, no, I don't have it on here, called the CRD2, which is a commercial demonstration of uh, debris removal. And uh, the first phase is to go up and inspect uh, the rocket body that they select. And then phase two, which will be awarded separately, will be to go up and uh, actually grab, dock with that uh, rocket body and bring it down. Um, Astroscale has been awarded phase one under a public-private public partnership, a PPP with, with JAXA, so we are working with them on that. And uh, we, we are hopeful that uh, we will be uh, competitive and we'll, we'll also capture the second phase, but that's still to be. All right, excellent, thank you. All right, so we're gonna move on to Michelle now and uh, please leave your questions on the Q&A box. For everyone, don't delete them, uh, don't move them. We'll ask all those questions afterwards when we finish. So uh, the floor is yours, Michelle. Um, uh, Ron, you, can, you need to remove your video if, if you don't mind. And also then, Michelle, if you want to put your video on, uh, people can see you as well. Thank you. Yep. Okay, the video should be on. I can see you. Yep. And now I just need to share the screen again, which should be in a second. Here we go. I think you can see and hear me. Yep. Perfect. Oh, great. Uh, well, thank you very much, Tony, for organizing this uh, event today. It's great to be here with uh, fellow servicing companies. 
these orbit Feldman astro scale. So I'm here to talk to you about how Lift Me Off fits in within the panorama of the servicing markets. We are not uh, a servicing mission provider. We're actually developing the tools necessary for companies like Astroscale and others to implement their servicing technologies in a cost-effective manner. Um, because we do see uh, this evolving ecosystem. Daniel mentioned it very well in the beginning that in-orbit servicing is happening today and growing and there's more and more markets happening. Um, we start with recovery, so active debris removal, something Astroscale is, is really focused on as the first market. Uh, repairing satellites is something key. If we send up more assets, we need to be able to repair them as they fail, because they're expensive assets, but they're also a threat. Refueling satellites, and Daniel can mention and talk way more about that than we can, and he's, he's covered that. But also we're looking at assembling objects in space. Um, being able to build bigger payloads in space, or actually reuse objects in space, reassemble satellites, repurpose them for other missions is really going to provide for a completely new sustainable space economy and allow us to have this ever-growing space market. And funny thing is I have this in here as well, uh, but everyone else has already mentioned it. For people who think servicing is something of the future, it's pie in the sky, it's, it's something which is happening today. And the clear demonstration as mentioned is Intelsat 901, which was I think a 15 or 16 year old satellite um, was put back into the service by, into service by Northrop Grumman when they docked to it in February and then April brought it back into a new geo slot so they can continue providing communications to ground. So these things are happening. What we do see is there are not many servicing missions. We need to really develop this ecosystem and make sure that it's cost effective. People are not gonna pay a high amount and high value to remove missions. Um, People want to extend the life of satellites communications because then they can offer service at a lower cost. So all of this needs to be viable. What we've seen is all the technology we've developed up to today and you know, in the past, if we look back, when it comes to servicing, have been quite bespoke. It's been agencies designing something for the ISS or we've repaired the Hubble telescope by using the, the spatial in the past. Um, even some of the servicing, servicing missions today, they only work for specific spacecraft or pre-programmed. All of this is expensive and bespoke. If we launch tens of thousands of satellites, we need to find a way where servicing needs to be more autonomous, more agile and adaptable to multiple payloads or objects. We need to really find technologies which allow, allow these servicing spacecrafts to go first, you know, remove a debris, but then maybe go over and repair a satellite and then be used as a refueling system. So that's where we're focusing on. And we're actually trying to develop the underlying technologies to enable servicing companies um, to do more and to provide a more cost-effective service. We do that by developing two technologies. Um, our first one is autonomous navigation. What we mean with this is we grab original well, heritage space payloads and by adding AI algorithms behind them, we can now allow a satellite to autonomously identify objects on orbit understand their features, so see, okay, that's a solar panel, that's the fueling port, that's the Apogee engine, and based on that, actually characterize the satellite, but also determine the best way to approach and dock it, and therefore really enable the servicing satellite to dock to almost anything. And then we couple that with uh, our agile propulsion system. If we look at the way technologies are designed today uh, for propulsion, they're very static. Uh, they're designed for uh, one mission, it's, it's, it's got to do one type of function. A servicing satellite needs to do multiple functions. It needs to reach the orbit, it needs to maybe identify the target, go around it, it needs to then do a maneuver to dock to it, and then it maybe needs to maneuver the two items together. So that's where we are designing propulsion systems with flexible and steerable technologies, which are also refuelable uh, using key technologies, so that again, we can allow uh, these servicing satellites to do more and more. So the way we fit within the picture is we are a technology provider with our propulsion hardware and autonomous navigation technology to companies such as Astroscale, Airbus, Northrop Grumman, ClearSpace. We feel if they, by using our technologies, they can further enhance their services and then go recover, repair, repurpose, or refuel satellites for the end users we have today, which are the commercial players or the agencies. So if we go a bit more detail, what we mean with our technologies, when it comes to autonomous navigation, um, we've designed a combination of payloads and sensors 
which at mid-range can identify objects, uh, understand is that a satellite, is that a, a, a non-satellite, what is, is it a threat to us, what is the size of the satellite, uh, what are the features of it, how far am I from it, how can I navigate towards it. And then we have our short range sensors which can actually acquire the image of the target satellite and automatically process every single feature and recognize uh, the satellite. They understand how it's moving relative to us. So then we can choose to actually navigate towards it and dock. So we might say, okay, there's a docking plate or fueling port or a specific area we need to dock to. Our software will then be able to give the input to the satellite to enable the docking maneuver. Uh, when it comes to propulsion, uh, we design high impulse propulsion systems. Uh, these are chemical propulsion systems with thrust vector control, which can provide a uh, very flexible thrust direction and thrust magnitude to small satellites from 12 to 500 kilograms. So they can actively maybe go around an object, inspect it or do the docking maneuver. And a key subset of that, which we see really is very important for when it comes to rendezvous and proximity operations, is our thruster gimbal technologies, which we've been developing. So we've identified that most servicing satellites need a lot of uh, high pulse rocket engines to be able to do the complex proximity uh, operation maneuver. And that is not cost effective, but also you can imagine that when a satellite docks to another object, the center of mass and the dynamics of this satellite changes and therefore your thrust direction isn't compatible anymore with the assembly or with the docked configuration. So having a way to reconfigure your rocket engine on orbit for this new uh, combined uh, mass is, is very important. So that's why this is one of the technologies we've developed is to enable us to have thrust vector control in orbit, which is uh, quite unique. Uh, we are Compared to Astroscale, who's been working in this very long and in orbit, we are quite a young company. Um, we've been going around two years. We're space experts who have worked in the domain of situational awareness and propulsion. And as innovators, we've seen, okay, how can we fill the gaps to really enable uh, this future space economy in an orbit servicing market? So that's why we've come together. Uh, our knowledge in propulsion and situational awareness have led us to enter these fields we are today. And we're guided also by key industry experts from customer and users who really say, okay, yes, that's how we see the market within those companies uh, evolving. We're based uh, in two locations in the UK on Harwell campus, where we do our mechanical design, our build of our propulsion system, all our testing. We have an office in the Westcott um, Venture Park, which is just north, which is the number one UK propulsion uh, facility in the UK. Uh, where we collaborate a lot with NAMO, who's there, they, they run most of the site. And then we have in Luxembourg, where we collaborate with the university and the computer vision uh, department. Uh, we, we actually have an office where we develop all our electronics or algorithms, and we're now setting up a rendezvous lab with the university to do development of our autonomous identification and also navigation technologies. Um, we are engaged with the market, although early on we've been talking with many companies to get their challenges and we work with all levels. So those people making propulsion systems who may be targeting RPO, we talk with them and sell them our components. We work platform providers to enable uh, their platforms to maybe be uh, enabled to detect objects on orbit or to give them the agility of a propulsion system. Um, and we're also talking with servicing companies, obviously, where we believe our technologies are a benefit. And we've been doing developments with the various agencies from civil to defense, uh, and we have contracts running with them. As I said, we're an early company. So today we are developing our technologies to TRL-6 by the end of the year, and we are actively working with parties to launch our technologies into orbit. Uh, that's our propulsion system and our payloads for the computer vision in 2021. So we can demonstrate on orbit the agility of our propulsion system and also demonstrate by generating data on orbit our autonomous navigation. Uh, we will not be running full autonomy in space because there are lots of challenges still to cover there from a regulatory perspective, from a technological perspective. So we'll be validating our autonomous uh, computer vision technology on ground with space-based data. Our full autonomy mission will be later. We're doing a second in-orbit demonstrator where we will be working with a partner to dock to them and to do a servicing mission, but that is for us to just demonstrate our technology. So 
we'll have our camera payloads, our software running on board, and our propulsion technology doing a first inspection and then a full docking to another servicing satellite, uh, demonstrating the combination of our technologies so that they can be sold into the market further. Um, as we are young and it's a big challenge, I think the previous uh, people mentioned it and, and seeing from the questions in the crowd, there's still a lot of steps which need to be done from a technological, from a legislation, a regulatory perspective. Um, so we're always open to engage with agencies and industry, discuss joint development possibilities, share mission opportunities and support partners with common goals because that's a, a key thing for us is if we want the on-orbit servicing infrastructure to, to grow and, and to be there, we need to work together um, from a public and a private perspective. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to now open up a couple of questions for yourself. Uh, maybe Drashti Ben Patel. Uh, I'm going to ask Drashti Bell to ask the question live. Let's see if I can get a hold of Drashti Bell on, on the board here. Here it is allowed to talk. I think you need to unmute if you can, Dashi Bell. Dashi yes. Ben. Uh, hi, Michelle. Uh, hi. It's really great to hear your presentation. Like, uh, so I have a question regarding like autonomous navigation. Uh, you mentioned like mid-range and short-range sensor that you are using. So, what kind of sensor like you specifically, you know, distinguish for both of, like, yeah, mid-range, short-range. Um, yeah, we, uh, we don't disclose that the type of sensors we use within design because that's part of the combination uh, of the IP. Um, but there are today already space sensors on the market, uh, just be it, you know, visual LIDAR, infrared type technologies uh, available, which are used for other applications, uh, maybe for sensing or for, for even doing landing on the moon, where if enhanced with uh, specific algorithms, you can uh, enable them to be used for servicing. So we are actually using space grade sensors already available in the market today, uh, and we're doing the algorithms and the, the software behind it to, to reconfigure them for uh, in-orbit servicing applications. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Grimmett, I'll ask you also to ask a question. Uh, to Michelle, let me just find you on the board here. Ooh, let me see. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Good, thank you, Jerome. Um, my question is about uh, what kind of range your sensors has. Is the mid and short range? I'm just kind of curious. Are you talking kilometers away? Are you talking, you know, a couple hundred meters? You know, because I mean, it's there's a lot of space out there, so. <laughs> Yeah, so our mid-range sensors um, work around from 40, 50 kilometers. Um, that's when we uh, can already identify, do, and, and start doing relative navigation. And then our short-range sensors will start within uh, the kilometer all the way up to actually the few meters uh, before the docking. That's kind of the, the split between the two. Very cool, thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, anonymous question for you, Michelle, again. What are, the, what are your ideas on validation efforts to convince customers about black box live AI vision systems? <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's very critical. Uh, resilience, reliability is very important when it comes to autonomy levels. The last thing anybody wants is an autonomous satellite hitting into another object and um, creating more space debris or even creating legal issues. So the way we are seeing it is our first mission has no autonomy on board. It just generates the data and it validates the autonomy level on ground on the bench test. That uh, enables us also to demonstrate some key elements. Our second autonomy mission will be with a joint partner which involves a risk. It'll only be a demonstrator. When it comes to uh, in doing first customers, we will most probably have an autonomy level where the satellite that initially proposes actions, um, saying, I would like to do this, I would like to do this, but it will still be a human uh, confirming it. And once we have enough validation on orbit and, and, and kind of the, the trust is there, then the human side of it can be uh, so like reduced over the years, but it will really depend from customers. 
and we are actively discussing with customers. Some are more comfortable, some are less comfortable with the autonomy side. So it, it is a discussion and, and that's why you see our second mission is, is later because the amount of autonomy we do there, there's a lot more risk and, and obviously we need to get that right. Another one, Anonymous, uh, what thoughts have you given to liability and licensing nation responsibility for vehicles? Um, so we will not do the servicing. So uh, we won't be doing the licensing side. However, we are involved. Um, I think we mentioned before conference, uh, Daniel mentioned it before that they're involved also on, on regulatory. The UK where we are based, there's a lot of discussion on regulations on servicing because today there, there are a lot of questions from insurance, from satellite operators, how will this work? So we, we as companies need to work close. I think Astroscale and, and, and OrbitFab will be more knowledgeable in, in answering and, and, and in covering their end just because as technology providers, we will sell into the servicing company. So we won't have to license. Obviously our technology need to work and our customers and end customers need to make sure it, uh, it works. And, and part of the licensing routine will be checking, okay, what will be the mission do, doing? What are the technologies and everything? Um, I feel regulatory wise, we're not there yet, um, but I might be wrong because let's say I'm, I'm least knowledgeable of the three members on the panel. Perfect. Okay. So we now, uh, thank you so much, Michelle and uh, the three panelists for uh, presenting and taking some questions. We now have the floor open to more Q&A. I have about 24 questions here on the screen. Uh, let's uh, get all the panelists on the, on the screen now. All of you, please. Thank you. And myself. Perfect. Okay. Um, let's uh, start with the, at least my question. I mean, I'm curious. Uh, I suppose all three of you are um, working in the same uh, sector. Um, do you feel uh, you are competing with each other or you are complementing each other instead? I, I think we're, if I look at it, we're very complementary. Um, I look on our end, we developed the technologies which we hope would enable AstroScale uh, to go execute the, the services. I imagine that AstroScale will eventually want to reuse their missions multiple times and therefore will need someone to go to to be refueled and then they'll go use uh, the refueling station. So I think all of the three different building blocks are necessary for the on-orbit servicing market and we, we all provide our part and there might be some technological elements where we're doing something similar but the value proposition we offer is I feel completely different. What about uh, you guys, Ron and Daniel, any comments? Yeah, I, I agree entirely. At least the three companies that are represented here today are very, uh, are very complementary. The, most of the overlap, I think, between the three of us would, between, uh, would be between Astroscale and OrbitFab. Uh, we, however, have a very close working relationship with, with OrbitFab. Uh, we, we know these guys. We love what they're doing. We think that refueling is, an, is a huge enabler to the space economy, not just for our own business case, but, um, uh, but for all the other reasons that Daniel mentioned in, in, his, uh, 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 in his pitch. So uh, th there's a very complementary relationship there. Now, of course, there are, there are competitors, uh, but space, is, space is, is an interesting industry, right? Where um, uh, we, we use the term here, maybe it's a Colorado thing, but we talk a lot about competimates, right? Where sometimes there's other companies that are, you know, other small companies or even large companies where um, we are uh, uh, competing on certain things and then we turn around and, and uh, collaborate and, uh, uh, on, on something else. And uh, even, even where you're a straight up competitor, there's always room to uh, collaborate where it makes sense. So we know the, the folks at Northrop Grumman uh, very well. Uh, Joe Anderson, who heads up that team over there, you know, we've talked about um, uh, uh, working together on, through confers and forums like that on policy issues. So not all collaboration necessarily is technological in nature. But there's a lot of important regulatory work to be done and a lot of room to collaborate there as well. So there, there's always room uh, competition is important, right? We're, we're in a free market economy, but, uh, but collaboration is, is also equally important. Excellent. Um, Daniel, any, anything on your side? Otherwise, I'm going to go on the Q&A directly now. 
No, I think they summed it up uh, really well. Perfect. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, where is it? I had someone here called Daniel. Uh, he's gone. I had a question from Daniel. Okay, well, I'll come back to him again. Uh, a question for uh, Jeremy again. What kind of fuels are you going to be offering? Uh, green, hydrazine, or both? I think that originally this question was actually uh, aimed at Daniel. Yeah, uh, so we, of course, are going to respond to what our customers want. And currently, uh, more than half the satellites in orbit are using hydrazine. Uh, the electric propulsion systems, which use a xenon propellant, are becoming a lot more popular. And so, uh, so there are quite a lot of those systems as well. And so that's what we get the most questions about from our customers. Now, there are a lot of other propellants that are used and that are being developed, and they have um, different advantages. And so we're, we're talking with different thruster providers and different, different customers about uh, the green propellants and, uh, and various things. One thing that we are adamant about in the early years of, uh, of our development, we are staying away from cryogenic propellants. Uh, we are focusing on the store, storable propellants that are used by satellites. Uh, there is a lot of interest around the, the moon programs uh, to look at cryogenic propellants, hydrogen and oxygen specifically, that might uh, be made from the water that's on the moon and, uh, and be put into an architecture around that. Um, we're somewhat skeptical about that because of the, the cost of that technology and the bulk and weight of that technology relative to others, uh, even though it is somewhat uh, more fuel efficient. So we're, we're trading all of those off, but really focused on, on what our customers want today uh, and making sure we deliver that. Thank you. Um, Mark Brady, would you like to ask a question? Mark? Mark Brady? Yeah, my question Thank you very much, Tony. You're doing a great job. And gentlemen, very good presentations. The, the quick question is standards. You know, having uh, a common interface that we can get refueled, you know, simplifies the design for what we are looking for as end users, you know, down the road. And we'd obviously like to have, you know, some uh, lowering of the risk and, of course, the cost of not having multiple interfaces. So is there any standards that are being discussed? Considering that, uh, that we're building a fueling port, I guess I'll, I'll kick this one off. Um, we tried to buy a fueling port and failed. Um, we couldn't build our first operational tanker because we couldn't find a, a fueling port for it. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a port that's been made by NASA Goddard, but it's been made with a, uh, with a set of requirements that were different from, from what we had and what we found that, it, that our customers would have. Um, so it's, it's quite a good fueling port for what it's built for, but it's not built for the ecosystem that, that we were hoping to, to help uh, establish. And so, uh, so we just went ahead when, when nobody would sell us one and decided that was going to be our first product. Uh, now, I'm not gonna say that that's going to be the standard. And if you look at how standards evolve over time, they are the things that people find are useful and convenient and available and they're things that, that people want to use and they evolve. And you can try and define a standard um, in advance that typically fails. Uh, what is more typical is that the industry works things out and then when people know what works and what doesn't, then people sit down and, uh, and the industry gets together and writes out you know, what a standard is going to be. Uh, based on experience. So we've got to establish that experience first and that's the stage that we're at right now. That doesn't mean that we can't establish best practices for, for the operations and the safety and, uh, and all of those types of things. But when it comes to the actual interface standards, there's an evolution that needs to happen. And uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to help that happen as quick as we can. Uh, so if I may, just to add to that, just 30 seconds. Um, uh, I, I mentioned during my presentation that Astroscale is very heavily involved in, in policy and in, in, uh, standards uh, shaping in a variety of different uh, forms, but we agree 100% with what uh, Daniel said, right? The role of standards formulation and, and policy development should be to specify the what, the desired outcome, and not the how, right? Uh, as Daniel said, it, 
it, it inevitably fails because no one person or organization setting standards has a view of the entire view of the economics and, and all of the pricing schemes, et cetera, to make a viable decision. The market is genius at doing this, and we should leave it to the free market to determine uh, what standards are eventually, uh, what technologies are, are uh, adopted. Okay. Um, Michelle and Ron and Daniel, you, if you open the Q&A uh, window, you can see lots of questions. If you feel there is a question you would like to answer, uh, please uh, just take one and, and read it out and, and answer it as well. Uh, there is one for um, Michelle, I think. Uh, I possibly Michelle, Ron here. Uh, anonymous question. ADR is a key mission for sustainable space. Do you guys see government spending the money anytime soon? I, I think I'm happy to, to answer. I think what Ron mentioned before is, is a key thing. I believe, Ron, you're working with JAXA in a joint government private mission. So I think I'm gonna leave it to you to, to point that one out. Yeah, right. So um, we're, we're starting to see the beginning uh, of that. So it, it depends on the, the segment of the market that, that we're talking about. So in terms of um, debris uh, mitigation uh, issues, um, we are, are seeing Japan step up and, and, and show leadership in putting money behind it. Uh, the European Space Agency also has a couple of different uh, programs that they have been um, uh, sponsoring and engaged with. Somebody asked about it earlier uh, via the uh, collaboration with, with OneWeb. Um, so uh, European Space Agency has also uh, been working some public-private partnerships. Uh, right now, the uh, US government, NASA, uh, is very focused on uh, the Artemis program and getting back to the moon. Uh, the, uh, the, some of the author NASA authorization acts have included some language about space debris uh, uh, but that has not translated in, into dollars yet, but we're confident that the time will come. Space situational awareness, the Department of Commerce here in the United States is uh, trying to uh, take an active role in, in uh, taking leadership of that uh, from uh, Air Force Space Command and uh, offering that as a public service to the entire world, not just the United States. Japanese are also investing a lot in, in SSA capabilities as well. And uh, the life extension uh, market, um, again, I think we're gonna see a lot of, uh, b both, both Leo and Geo, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, government spending from the national security space community that is starting to take a look at um, uh, on-orbit servicing as a way of enhancing uh, mission uh, effectiveness and ensuring uh, you know, the, the, the safe operation of, of space. All right, thank you. I'm gonna go, if, if anyone, uh, again, as I said, find a question to answer, let me know. I'm gonna go from the top and then one by one, I'm gonna go down. So Matthias Krieger uh, is not on the list anymore. How, he's asking a question, how do you manage the speed difference between orbiting satellites and the orbit of the gas station, which may have incompatible speeds? I think this was based for Daniel. Sounds like it was. Yeah, in, uh, in orbit, you have to match the relative speed and the, and the position to be able to perform a docking. And so that, uh, that rendezvous um, you know, requires you to have some fuel and to, to be good at orbital mechanics. Uh, we, we have a network of tankers that we'll be putting up into orbits that are close to where our customers want to be. And then we work with our customers to figure out the most efficient way to, to make that happen and make the delivery happen. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a, uh, a matter of moving the, the spacecraft to be together. Uh, it just takes time and it uses a bit of fuel. When we do the math on how much fuel that uses relative to what our customers uh, require, um, you know, we can still deliver propellant uh, at, uh, at a very cost effective rate uh, and we can still enable you know, a lot more missions from our customers. So we've built that into our supply models and, uh, and we're not too worried about how that works. Michelle, have you seen any questions you would like to answer from the list? Yeah, I saw one from uh, Sahana Shastri, and so who asked, "What are the major parts you consider to repurpose or reconfigure?" Uh, so a lot of people wonder, yeah, can you re reconfigure satellite in orbit? Is that possible? Well, what we've been seeing, and there's actually a case study done by one of the big telecoms mission about this, is you have big telecommunication satellites which go up there for 15 years or more. But you have a lot of small sat players sending up small you know, geo telecommunication satellites for four or five years. So you have young, cheaper payloads, but which are very innovative, competing to these old uh, 
bus size satellites, which are very expensive, they become antiquated. So the big telecoms providers are looking for a way to put a, a platform in space, which actually ha provides the, the big, there's the standard basic power, propulsion, you know, everything you need structure, but have a swappable payload unit so that you can send up uh, every few years a new amount of payload and a new a servicing spacecraft can switch around the transponders and actually provide uh, more data throughput or put the new technologies on board. So these are uh, case studies and uh, things which the big telecommunication companies uh, have done. And there is an open paper by SES explaining exactly how they would look at reconfiguring uh, satellites on orbit. I think, Ron, you actually tagged the question for yourself as well. Thank yeah, uh, there's a question here from an uh, anonymous attendee uh, asking about the business case for Leo, basically saying the market is not yet ready, uh, but satellite operators are not willing to invest in, in the orbit or other on orbit services at this moment. Uh, there's strong enforcement component with 25 year uh, legislation. You know, how are we managing this fact to getting customers? So, uh, you know, great question, which we get asked a lot about the business case in um, uh, for Leo debris removal. There's two components to that, right? There, there's the compliance with the regulatory regime, 25 year uh, rule it says if you're in Leo, you have to come down 25 years after uh, end, of, end of life. There, there is widespread um, agreement within the satellite community. And I've heard uh, CEOs of large companies, owner operators, as well as launch companies say that, yeah, this rule doesn't make sense in today's world anymore, right? Um, but of course, then investing in doing something more proactively about that uh, means investment, it means spending money, which means you know lower profits and uh, ultimately at the end of the day, companies have to make profits. Um, we really believe that the business case around uh, Leo debris removal is driven by risk reduction, right? Uh, it, it's a problem already today. And the problem is only going to grow as these mega constellations launch. We have tens of thousands of satellites in, in orbit, 10%, give or take, uh, of which are, are going to fail, which creates a huge risk of collision uh, to those own, uh, to their own uh, uh, constellations, right? Everybody said, well, space is big, but they're not going into random orbits. They're going into a very specific set of orbits. And every time you have to burn fuel to avoid colliding one of your own satellites, you are literally burning money, as you all know. So uh, there is a risk reduction where at some point it becomes more cost effective to just simply uh, outsource the service of removing that satellite out of orbit so that you don't have to, uh, uh, to remove the risk of colliding uh, into that, your own satellite. Plus there is then the uh, regulatory and the legal risk associated with somebody else bumping into your satellite or you bump one of your dead satellites bumping into somebody else's. Um, this is kind of a, a new area. There, there's not uh, a lot of, 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 uh, of case law uh, on it, but it's an area, uh, uh, you know, liability is an area that, that's uh, slowly evolving. We will get to the point where people are going to be held liable. And so de-risking the orbits from those perspective as a matter of business continuity in the owner operator's uh, own best interest is really what underpins the, that, that business case, which is why a lot of companies uh, are, are interested. And uh, uh, as many of you know, OneWeb had already taken proactive steps to put uh, some sort of the orbit mechanism, a docking plate actually, on all of their satellites. Thank you for that. Uh, Daniel, anything that you fancy uh, replying to? There's a few questions for you, actually a lot of questions for yourself from the very beginning on the list. Uh, yeah, where, uh, where would you like me to start on these? <clears throat> Well, uh, let's see. Um, the first one, Diana says here, in which orbits are these available and what happens at the end of the life? For example, I think that's a question for your, your uh, the tankers, I suppose. Yeah, so um, the answer, like many of these, is where the customers need us to be. Uh, at the moment, there's, there's clusterings of customers in geostationary orbit, in sun synchronous orbit, in, in various orbits for, uh, for communications uh, in low Earth orbit. Um, there's also a lot of activity around the space station. And so those are, those are the types of orbits that we're looking at, uh, at putting tankers into. And then of course we do the orbital mechanics and, uh, and as mentioned before, when, when we need to move the tanker closer to the customer, um, we want to find out what those, those preferred orbits are. So, uh, so we're looking at uh, putting up uh, a number of tankers into, uh, into those different orbits. And, uh, and that's the, um, yeah, that, that will establish our network. 
then uh, at end of life, uh, the intention is to deorbit them. Um, we want to be, uh, as I mentioned previously, um, taking out insurance policies and, uh, and deorbiting service contracts um, with companies like Astroscale, just in case we, uh, we have any issues and want, uh, want our tankers taken out of orbit. But uh, our tankers will have small thrusters, uh, possibly something from Lift Me Off, that will allow the tankers to, to move slowly between orbits and to get out of orbit at the end of life. Um, you know, moving a gas station is not something you want to do every day, but, uh, but we will have that capability if we need it. Okay, um, let's see, anything else from Michelle and Ron on, on the list that you'd like to answer? Um, I, yeah. I think there was a question on working with uh, insurance organizations. You know, do we work with insurance organization? Um, so that obviously everything we do has a positive impact, both on premiums on or how we operate in space. And I think the insurance uh, organizations are heavily involved. They get down to discussing with us, which make technology, they are part of some working groups. Uh, they, they get quite detail involved and they, they do know that our technologies and our services will enable them to ease their insurance, insurance propositions in the future. One clear one we've been talking about is using our computer vision. We can, for example, inspect the satellite on orbit. If you are taking a 15 year old satellite and want to re-put it into service, someone's gonna to wanna to insure this. So how do you do that? What are the risks involved? By inspecting it before you re-put it into orbit, you can determine the risk factors and therefore say, okay, what's the insurance premium, um, which I need to allocate to this 15 year old satellite because based on the imagery generated, it looks okay or there are some risks involved. So they, they are heavily involved and they are very knowledgeable what's going on and they speak to ourselves as technology providers. I can't speak for the other companies, but for sure, I, I'm sure they're involved. Ron, there's a couple of questions here for you. Uh, I think the first one uh, I'll read here, how long before Astroscale can address removing failed satellites in the geostationary orbit? And then the next one following below that is how does Astroscale plan to have their services paid for? What services do you foresee being the first to be utilized in a pr prolific manner? Mm -hmm. And the, the question after that about international collaboration is also very interesting. I'm going to try to hit all three of those real quick. First, let me uh, address uh, Michelle's point about uh, in insurance. Uh, so I talked about the risk reduction really underpinning the, the business case for LEO debris removal. Risk reduction equals insurance, right? So, uh, yeah, we are uh, uh, very um, engaged with the insurance community. Insurance has a very important role to play both not, not just from the traditional in insurance perspective, but also from incentivizing um, owner operators to, uh, uh, to de-risk their, their own satellites. So yes, insurance is absolutely uh, a critical component of the solution. Um, so how soon are we ready to uh, offer geo services? So we, we just completed, uh, as many of you might know, uh, the, the acquisition of the assets of uh, Effective Space Solutions, and we're in the process of polishing up that, uh, uh, that, that plan. So uh, of course, our first launch will be driven by customer demand. We are actively engaged with a couple of different customers, but you know, ballpark, we expect that somewhere within the two to three year time frame, uh, we will uh, be ready for, for action. Um, and as far as who's gonna pay for that services and other, uh, and other services, right? So in, in Geo, it's a pretty straightforward answer, right? That there's a, a very clear economic business case for, uh, for, for life extension, as witnessed by the fact that uh, Northrop Grumman is already out there doing it, as Daniel pointed out in his presentation. So, um, uh, so that that is the customer set that will pay for it. And then I think I already kind of addressed the question about who pays for it at Leo. It's a combination of uh, for the active debris removal piece, the things that are already up there. That's uh, nation states is that that responsibility falls uh, de facto uh, to nation states. And uh, for the end of life services, all of these mega constellations that are are being launched. Uh, again, that is, is paid for by the owner operator because it is in uh, their best interest from a business continuity and de-risking perspective uh, uh, to pay for that. It's, it's a lower cost than dealing with the cost of, of, uh, of not addressing the problem. And uh, the international collaboration question is, is great because this is obviously not uh, uh, the, a, a, a single nation kind of a problem. Uh, Like-minded nations um, uh, are, are starting to, to talk uh, either bilaterally or through international forums uh, such as UN COPUS uh, about how to address uh, the, the problem. 
And uh, different uh, nations, of course, have different uh, budget priorities and different ways they want to approach this, which is part of the reason that Astroscale, even though we're still a relatively young and small company and about you know, 130 or some odd employees have a real meaningful global footprint. And when I mean meaningful, so I worked at Boeing and, and Honeywell for a long time. And a lot of times you have uh, international offices with a couple of marketing and business development folks, but you really need to be able to understand the needs of customers in these different markets and uh, internationally is a real meaningful footprint, right? Engineers on the ground who can go and talk to customers and understand what their needs are and can then collaborate internationally. And so we've got a network just among our own company within Astroscale, the UK, Japan, and the US, uh, sharing technology to the extent that we can, right? There are some practical constraints in terms of export regulations, you know, ITAR and those sorts of things. But, um, uh, but to a certain extent, we do have the ability to, to share information and uh, bring the best of class to offer uh, value-added solutions to, to customers. Uh, that's just the Astroscale example. It's also equally important that other companies collaborate, that we have uh, supply chains that are, are international, that are robust uh, uh, to enhance our, our, our business case. So absolutely critical on a lot of levels. Let me uh, ask one last question from Nicolas Chamoussi. Nicolas, are you on the line? Can you, are you able to speak and ask the question? Let me see if Nicolas is on the line. Um, Okay, Nicholas, you can you can um, you can uh, speak now if you like. Sorry, you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, it took me a bit of time to unmute. Just a second, um, just a second, uh, Nicholas. While we uh, we have Nicholas asking the question, the other panelists, you can answer the question on the on the Q and A box directly if you wish to answer something. Uh, that way, we have more questions answered, even in writing to, to the to the attendees. Thank you so much. So, hey, Nicholas. Sorry. Yeah, I'm 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 sorry. First of all, I joined a bit late, so it might be that the question has been already answered, and it's it might be completely stupid and naive. I don't know. Just wondering whether would not. I mean, it's a hell of a job, but just to make sure that this universally imposed green sticker on anything that is launched um, into space to fund, uh, to, to stimulate and to fund the ADR missions and operators. Uh, same way as whenever you guys buy a refrigerator or a computer, you, there's, there's a bit of tax on it, which is funding kind of a public service of decommissioning, uh, uh, I'm just wondering, I mean, the, the, obviously the price of this ticket would be a bit a bit higher than for a computer or, or fridge, but uh, ju just an idea. Thank you. Uh, so MIT um, is uh, running, I forget the name of the consortium. I was trying to look it up here real quick, but uh, uh, I think it was the World Economic Forum uh, was leading an initiative to establish a, a space sustainability uh, rating. The MIT Media Lab is uh, leading that effort on their behalf together with the European Space Agency. Uh, very similar to that idea. It's a great idea, right? But buildings have the same thing. They have a lead standard. So uh, uh, there are people that are already looking at that. Um, look up space sustainability rating and uh, you'll be able to find more information on that online. Great. One last Thanks. question for myself gotcha. to everyone. Um, and uh, first of all, uh, get near the screen. Uh, we'll take a picture of the panel. And then uh, I'd like to ask a last question, maybe some comments. Ready for the picture? It's done. So in this uh, pandemic uh, situation, how is your company coping with? Uh, I know that AstroScale has got so many offices around the world. And then we have also Michelle starting up a company in the UK and Daniel in the West Coast. And so we are actually quite global here. How is your companies coping with this pandemic and uh, what's happening in the near future, basically? How, how quickly are you going to resume activities and, and so on? And any last uh, question, any last uh, thoughts as well from your company? Thank you. So as you can see, we've moved our operations to space. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the pandemic has, has actually not slowed down business. Uh, we've been signing new contracts. We've taken new investment. Um, we've been able to do quite a lot whilst we have everybody working from home. Uh, it has slowed down manufacturing a little. Um, and, uh, and so that's, uh, that's been one of the challenges, but, uh, we've actually, uh, just recently rented a new facility in San Francisco. Uh, 
Um, we're moving into that very cautiously in a, in a socially distanced way, but, uh, but that's given us more space so we can space our engineers out uh, more as they, as they work on the hardware, um, which um, these days is, is important to do. So we, we're very careful, very mindful of it. We work from home as much as possible, but it hasn't slowed us down too much. Um, there's still uh, a lot of demand and there's just a lot to do. So it's, uh, it's actually been a, uh, not a bad time for the company, um, whilst all the, all the people, of course, we've, uh, we've had to make sure we take care of them. Thanks. Um, Michelle or Ron? Yeah, um, yeah for us, I, I think it's very similar to what Daniel said. It hasn't really slowed us down. Obviously, the nature of space is that, you know, you have big projects, you work on development. Yes, maybe some manufacturing gets slower, but actually the engineers can continue developing. Um, funding public and private has continued to move forward. So while we are still forced all work from home in the UK, uh, our offices still are not open yet. Um, in Luxembourg, we are more relaxed. We, we, we can go into the office. Um, the only thing we see is our, our team does miss a bit, you know, being together. We, we are a small, young company. You're obviously going for a, a big goal. So sharing experience and everything is part of a uh, small startup. So I think that's the only thing is that sometimes the social interaction, we try to do as much online as possible, but uh, it, it doesn't always cover it. Um, yeah, same here for Astroscale, right? Work has not slowed down. If anything, things are busier than, than ever. Uh, we are effectively knowledge workers, right? As Michelle pointed out, there's a lot of design and engineering work that, that happens and we can do that effectively. Not, maybe sometimes not quite as effectively, but to a certain extent effectively from, from home. And we've been able to manage the, the needing engineers uh, and technicians uh, in, in, the, in, in the labs. You know, we've been able to, to manage that uh, uh, effectively. So, um, so, so by and large, you know, of course, uh, none of us wish to be in the situation where you hope we can get back to the office. But um, um, th there's been a, a certain narrative. There are a lot of uh, press reporting about the, the economic impacts of this on the space industry and some suggestions that maybe governments should step in and, and fail or uh, 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 buy out or support failing companies. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm a strong proponent of free market economics, as you probably gathered from my comments earlier, and I think it's patently absurd to think that governments have uh, a role in, in stepping in and, and buying a, a, uh, a failing company. You know, the, 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 the market will decide, uh, uh, you know, who the, who the uh, survivors are, and um, uh, the companies that were already in a weak position uh, will, will likely suffer, and companies that uh, were in a strong position We'll, we'll, we'll thrive and uh, we're you know we're happy to report that not just us but obviously my colleagues here with me today are are, uh, are doing well and we're, we're thriving excellent thank you thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, your uh, comments um, and, and thank you for joining us this this, this week uh, it's been a great pleasure to have you here on the access space Alliance uh, webinars um, I wish you good luck with everything uh, to you and also to our audience and uh, attendees uh, uh, as well uh, to be safe uh, and as well as uh, good luck with everything. Um, next week we'll have uh, some uh, panel on, on the ITU, uh, WRC, coming WRC, and then we'll take a rest for a few weeks. But uh, thank you very much, uh, attend, uh, uh, you know, again to be here. Good luck with everything. Thanks also to Lift Me Off for the sponsorship this week. Michelle, uh, and hope to see you soon. Thank you very much, Tony. And Take care. Uh, thanks, All the Ron best. and Daniel. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tony. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.